Hey everyone, I have a very special guest for you today. I have someone that I know and respect and look at daily. Uh, this is an individual that has been giving back for multiple decades and changing people's lives. So I was so thrilled uh, when he agreed to do this interview. Let's welcome Tom Ferry to the show. How you doing, Tom? I'm doing super good, Michael. Hey, thank you for, uh, for that kind introduction and following my content. Uh, that means a lot to me. I appreciate it. Yeah, the one thing I got to tell you about your content is, is uh, it's motivating. And it, it should be motivating to people that aren't even in real estate, as real estate agents or investors. People should follow you if they just want to feel better. I appreciate that. Thank you. I mean, I, I have to tell you, I don't mean to be uh, motivational in any way, shape, or form. And yet, um, I do understand having started multiple businesses and being an entrepreneur and, and that there just is that element that sometimes we need that little extra push, you know, and that could just be in the form of a, a good idea that yeah. germinates in our brain. It suddenly has us more likely to be in action. And that's probably more the way I roll, but so thank you. That's very, very cool. Well, first thing I think we should do, because maybe there's 1% of my audience that doesn't know who Tom Ferry is. How would you kind of introduce yourself to the world in a couple of minutes? Um, I would say, you know, I have a, maybe a typical story if it comes to, you know, being an entrepreneur, uh, you know, born and raised in Southern California, uh, you know, had a, have a crazy father who uh, worked for a guy named Earl Nightingale and Earl Nightingale, if you know anything about the motivational speaking industry, his sort of direct connection was to this guy, Napoleon Hill, who wrote a little book called Think and Grow Rich. So the joke is like some people were raised on milk and cookies and some of my friends, because I lived on Huntington Beach, were like surf and skate. I did a little bit of that. But unlike most of them, I was exposed to people like Zig Ziglar, Brian Tracy. I met Tony Robbins when I was like 17 or 18 when he wasn't even Tony Robbins yet, just because of the, you know, the, the sort of family dynamic and business. Uh -huh. But in fairness, Michael, I never, I never got into that stuff. I was also Mohawk, screw you, kicked out of four high schools kicked out of both parents' homes, they were divorced. And, you know, if you look at my personality profile, it's like high I, high D. So, you know, I took that into being the worst kid I could be. <laughs> and then finally had just a, you know, probably like many people that are, that are entrepreneurs or intrapreneurs, you know, with your audience, you know, you finally wake up. I jokingly say, cause like I've got, you know, lots of, you know, lots of people that work for me and, and friends and teammates. And I get the chance to mentor some high school kids and college kids. I, I used to say, look, you know, you got to figure it out by the time you're 30. Now I'm like, you got to figure it out by the time you're 35. And I got one of my buddies. I'm like, look, if you could figure it out by the time you're 50, that would be awesome. <laughs> um, I think I was lucky that at 18, I had that epiphany that, you know what? The, the past doesn't equal my future. You know, I don't have to be in a job that I don't like. It doesn't matter that I didn't get a college degree, that I've got some natural gifts. I don't know really how to optimize them or maximize them yet, but I did decide in that moment, you know what, I'm going to go look at my family business and I'm going to go take that business over. And if, if you would have asked me, Michael, like to like the original conversation with my dad, when I walked up with like flaming purple <laughs> hair, working at a grocery store from midnight to nine, and I'm like, I want to run your company. And he was like, when the drugs wear off, <laughs> come talk to me. I didn't even know what that meant, right? But what I knew was the path that I was on was not the path that I, I, I ultimately should be on. Yeah. And I'd taken this sort of rebellious nature as far as I wanted it to go. And it was now time to, to do something better. Now, I still got a little punk rock in me. You know, that's never going to go away, right? You know, if you look at my record collection and I did say, <laughs> record. Um, <laughs> it still speaks to that. But, you know, I think for your audience to understand, I went to work for a, a family business. And if you know anything about that, you, you either are the kid that is going to become a professional son, right? And I, I certainly know a few of those, especially in the real estate related families that I know. Yeah. Um, I got the exact opposite. Here is the crappy job, learn it from the inside out, do everything for less pay, and you're going to earn your way if you ever get there. I wanted to be the president in five years. It took me nine years to get there. By the time I took it over, I understood the industry. I understood the dynamics. I knew who the players were. I knew the mechanics of you know, the levers to pull, if you will, inside our own business. I'd already optimized multiple parts of the business and helped it go from three to about seven million in various different roles. But when I took over, myself and the, the new executive team I put in place drove from seven to 45 million in a matter of six years. 
and you know, every, every small business owner with 32 million small businesses in the U S only 4% of them do more than a million dollars a year in revenue. Yeah. But when you get north of five, then north of 10, then north of 25, you're getting into rarefied air in terms of, you know, business revenue, that kind of stuff. So, you know, that was kind of the, that for me was the journey. And then I left 16 years ago and started my own business and haven't looked back. Yeah. And again, the, the reason I wanted to go through that story is because, you know, in the social media world, well, first and foremost, both of us, right, we're about the same age. Social media wasn't a thing, right, when we got out of high school or, or at 18 no. or 19, right? It wasn't a thing. Michael, so we, Michael, thank goodness. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, man, I do not want evidence of some of those things that I did in high school for sure. Yes. No, no, thank you. Um, uh, but the, the whole idea there is there are so many people who maybe have a past that they let anchor themselves. Yeah. Right. And it just comes to a point where you need to make a decision. Yours was at 18. Mine was at 30 and it's okay. Right. It, it's, it's okay yeah. to pivot, change, realize that you need to do something different. Um, yeah. And, and life is about being happy. Right. That yeah. was the thing that I got wrong. Right. I, I grew up in a very, very poor environment where money was a stressor and you know, if money was around the family. We were happy. And if it wasn't, we were unhappy. And so I had a problem with money through, 30 earned it, spent it. But um, yeah, it's, people need to realize that there are people that uh, can change your life and you're living evidence of that. So uh, yeah, it, it, it's pretty I, awesome. I totally appreciate that story. And I want to be clear, like the, the person that people see in social or our events or the things we do on video, like if you really listen to me, one of the most consistent things that I bring up is all of the mentors, yes. the men and women that helped me get here. And when I think about real estate specifically, remember the great book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, right? Oh, yeah. Le legendary, you know, legendary book and legendary piece of work. So I had rich mom, poor mom. Oh, and, okay. And really, if I was, you know, if, if both of them were here, my biological mom and my stepmom, I would say rich mom, rich mom. One was rich in the arts uh, and one was rich in real estate. Okay. So, so you know, kind of take, taking from both and honoring both, my biological mom you know, she was pulled out of a lineup by Walt Disney and became one of the original Mouseketeers at the theme park. Wow. You know, where my, where my stepmom, who and I, I call them both mom, um, she moved here from Honolulu. She's the, she's basically the, the child of a military officer from Russia who ended up in Pearl Harbor. Oh, wow. And her mom, who basically was the quintessential, you know, 1930s, 1940s, Polynesian girl, right? And these two marry, and <laughs> out comes my stepmom, who is basically as Russian tough as nails as they come, <laughs> but throw a ukulele on her and she can start jamming, right? So right. it's this strange sort of dichotomy. But when she moved here to California in 18 with like $100 in her pocket, she, her first job, she got introduced to, to what is now a family mentor of ours who owned in the range of 2,000 units between Santa Barbara and San Diego. Mm. You have some SFRs, a lot of multi-unit, a, a lot of apartment buildings. So, you know, you know, right, yeah. being in this space, back in the day, late 60s, early 70s, even certainly through the 80s, there was a lot of opportunity to buy property, no money down, get 105% finance. So, so by the time I, you know, really got to know her, because I'm working inside this, you know, dysfunctional family business. And I don't mean that as a knock on my parents because you know every family business is slightly dysfunctional. <laughs> the one thing she said to me was, Thomas, the first thing you need to do is go buy a house. Ah. So by the time I was 19, I closed on my first property. And she was also smart enough to say to me, you can either live in it or you could stay here at the house and just rent it out. And I was like, well, you know, like, well, why would I buy it and rent it out? <laughs> 19, right? You don't know. Yeah. But then she said to me, I'm like, no, I really want to own my own place because, you know, living at home with my parents after being yeah. kicked out at 16 is kind of weird. Yeah. I said, how about instead, what if I got a roommate and I gave my roommate the better room? I stayed in the crappy room and my roommate's rent covered my mortgage, my utilities, all my expenses. And I basically lived for free. Wow. It was the She's the one that taught me that stuff. Like buy more real estate. <laughs> You're the OG of ha house hacking. That's what that's what the kids would call it today. Yeah, I mean, I you know, I, I, I don't know. I think <laughs> I, I think a lot of us that are watching, and Michael, I, you know, I, I assume that many of the, the people that follow you 
look to you in that mentorship role that you know, give me guidance, Michael, like yes. you've been there, done that. Yeah. I'm just so blessed that I've got all these incredible people, my mom being one, both of them, you know, that, that said to me, okay, you're making money. Don't be stupid. Buy a house. Yeah. You know, well, and I'll sell it and buy another one and another one and another one and then keep them and rent. And you know, like that's the game. Yeah. No, I really, what you're saying there that people really need to pick up on is you not only need to seek mentors in relationships, but you also need to listen, right? You need to shut your mouth and, and listen, right? The whole two ears, one mouth story. Yeah. Um, and that's, I think that's hard. I mean, you know, my God, especially you know, at 19, <laughs> especially at 29, 39, 49, 59, 69, you know, that, that whole fixed mindset, growth mindset from yeah. Dr. Carol Dweck, which I'm sure you've studied and, yep. you know, like that's, you know, I don't know. How many kids do you have? Or do you have kids? One. We have one. She's, it's hard to call her a kid. She's 28 now. So Yeah. Yeah. Right. I got, a, I got an 18 and 20-year-old that are both going on like, I don't know, sometimes between 14 and 40. <laughs> and, and always being in that, you know, that gentle reminder to stay in the growth mindset. Yeah. You know, it's just super easy to get fixated on what's true and what isn't and never actually stop and say, is there a better way? should I listen to some more people before I just go all in on something? Cause yep. you know, you and I both know, especially in investing. Oh, that's where you get in trouble. Oh yeah. Yeah. The market will, if you get arrogant or cocky or any other adjective you want to put on that, the market will humble you. It 1, just 000. will. 1000%. Yeah. yeah. One of the, one of the quotes that you have, and there's so many that I like, but the one that I took down for this interview was, uh, it's a simple truth. Experience only comes from making mistakes. Yes. You remember that one? I mean, it's the, it's, so Mike Vance, um, so for the people that are watching this, Google the name Mike Vance and, and think about how, how blessed and lucky I was to have this guy in my life. He uh, was basically uh, interviewed and hired on the spot by a guy named Walt Disney. His first business card said, in charge of ideas and people development for the Walt Disney Company. And now we're going back to like the 60s. Right. He was the first dean of the Disney University. Walt had passed. He launched Orlando and basically was like, okay, I think I've gone as far as I can go. You know, the bean counter brother that he sort of always like joked, joked about. He said, you know, Walt, I would, I would fall into any war, but I'm not going in for an accountant. So <laughs> nothing, no knock against accountants, just telling you how he tells the story. Yeah. His, his next mentorship that he, so he's mentored by Walt while he's mentoring others. Mm -hmm. The next person he mentors is a guy named Jack Welch, who we all know what happened to Jack. Then he becomes very close with a guy named Mother Teresa. Oh, wow. Imagine, imagine Michael, could you imagine having a conversation on a Monday at nine o'clock in the morning, first with Jack Welch about, you know, be neutron Jack, take out the world, be number one in everything you do. And then the next conversation with Mother Teresa. No, I think my brain would explode, but that'd be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Well, so what if I told you that fast forward 10 years later, it was Jack, it was Mother Teresa, and then it was Steve Jobs. Wow. If you read all the early books, as a Silicon Valley guy, you oh, can yeah. appreciate, you read all the early books on Apple, um, there's this story where Mike Markula, who you know, was the first one to write a check for $250,000 when they were still in the garage. Yep. Right? And so Markula, I get like truth bump, goosebumps, whatever you call him, just thinking about the story. Um, he's sitting in this, in this room where... Mike is now out doing talks, talking about the Disney way, uh -huh. right? And, and what they did at Walt Disney and how every business could take that on. And we saw Jack Welch build his university. We saw Hamburger U, which was, you know, sort of the same exact thing as Disney U, right? From yep. McDonald's and so many other businesses followed some of his early innovations. Walt Disney called this guy, by the way, the most creative man on the planet. Oh, wow. That's a, that's a pretty, you know, when you're, when you're also hanging out in a meeting with Salvador Dali and <laughs> others that Disney would use back in the days for their either idea development, et cetera, pretty, pretty cool thing. So he's sitting in this room, he's doing a talk, and this guy walks up and says, look, I just wrote a check for this company, these kids that are building these computers, and I think they remind me a lot of the way you're describing Walt Disney, but they don't have the framework of how they did it. Would you be willing to come up and consult with us and, and you'll appreciate this. He said, sure, I'd love to do it. Are you guys raising money? Well, oh. yeah, I just wrote the first check. Great. I'll take options over cash. There you that go. was a good move. That was a good move. You with me? So you know, if you think about the long-term benefits, well, anyway, Steve Jobs, if you read all the early books, you know, Mike ended up helping him create uh, what we would think of as the, the 
let's get all of our computers into the schools, yep. right? That was one of his projects, right? Back in, you know, I forget which, which model it was, but it was the one with all the colors, et cetera. Yeah. Anyway, I give you all of that just for context. So when Mike and I started working together and he was a mentor, coach, friend, whatever you want to call it, I was in a place in my life where I was looking to make some, some big moves and I needed some guidance. And one of the things he said when I said, you know, Mike, like, I really think, which is, by the way, a very scary thing to say, <laughs> yeah. I really think I could go do X and create Y result. And, you know, Mike had this big personality, 6'4", we used to joke like 6'5 with his hair because it was always kind of out and wild like this. And he would say, Tom, listen, you can only learn from experience and experience is all coming from making massive failures, massive mistakes, you know, like over and over again. He's like, so go ahead and do it. Yeah. Get your ass kicked. Learn the lessons because it'll make you even better yeah. the next time you think something's going to work. Yeah. So that actually became, Michael, for me, this whole discipline around A-B testing everything. Awesome. Right? Like, like th there should never be, like, not, not being political, but like, it, it would suck in the world if there was only a CNN, a CNN and no Fox News. Right. Right. Like you need not using that, you know, you need dark to appreciate light. You need the sun going up to appreciate the sun going down. Yep. And you can't pick a killer idea and say, this is it without looking at the contrast of that idea and then figure out what's the balance. And then you go out, you take action, you get your butt kicked because that's the way the world works. And hopefully you document the process, Yes. You learn the lessons. So the next time you're presented with a deal that you want to go into or a new piece of real estate, before you just go, oh God, I'm just enamored by the product and where it is and the location and rent roll and the, the terms, et cetera. But let me go through all the times I got my ass kicked. Yep. I apologize for cursing, but you know what I mean? Like, yeah. let's go through that. And now let me look at it from that perspective differently. Yeah. Yeah, again, what he's giving you here, folks, is the gold here, right? He's saying fail fast, you know, perfection. You, you don't wait for perfection. It's not there. Fail fast, but document and learn the lessons, right? A failure without learning the lessons is a waste. And I often say uh, the most expensive mistake is the one that's repeated. So yeah. learn from your mistakes. So uh, I was listening awesome. to uh, Ray Dalio this morning, and I'm sure. Oh, know, yeah. It's bulls, right? So. Mm -hmm. So Ray said something interesting, and this is something that I had heard from another one of my mentors, that everything that, that is about to happen has already happened 10,000 times. <laughs> exactly. You know what That's I mean? A, yeah. The rise and fall of a nation, the ups and downs of a relationship. You know, Mike would say creativity is simply rearranging the old in a new way. There you and go. And then he would remind me as an entrepreneur, do you want to be an iterative entrepreneur or do you want to be the one that is out there blazing the new trail? He said, let me remind you, these people usually end up getting killed. Yes. Exactly. These people take something that's already existed and, you know, like it already existed yeah. and make it better. There you go. That's a great example. Uh, I want to go back to Rich Mom because I think this is a great area where we can kind of tie these stories together because you, you speak yeah. to and are such a big influencer with real estate agents and real estate yeah. brokers. My channel is about real estate investing, you know, one rental at a time, all of that. Um, the, the one topic I knew I wanted to talk with you about is how can agents create relationship with investors? And I mean real investors, not the time wasters. So we can talk about yeah. that. But the repeat yeah. buyers. Because if, you know, if a good agent is doing 30 deals a year, what would happen if you had half those baked in with investors? So I thought that'd be something we could talk about. So, uh, so I, I think, um, it, I, don't, I don't think, I know the way we built this company was around this, this framework. There's no wrong way to generate a client. Yep. Right. Like the, you know, in the, in, in most businesses, you've got camps, right? Like the digital marketing camp today, <laughs> we're going to do everything through social. Yeah. You know, the screw that, we're going to have a sales force, right? Or we're going to do direct mail or we're going to do television. And, and even back in, in the day, um, there was a, a published list, Michael, that in, in, I would say it was like in partnership with the Wall Street Journal in the very beginning, it was the top 100 residential real estate agents. Oh, I remember that. Yeah. Right? yeah. So on that first list, 16 of them were my personal coaching clients. Wow. And every one of them did something different, but most of them blended multiple things together. You with me? Yeah. So, so what I, I say that because I have been preaching and, and providing strategies and tactics to real estate agents 
for about a decade and a half saying, look, today you would go onto Facebook and you would say, every month I come across, a, and you, you probably do it like this, you know, hey, every month yeah. I come across a smoking hot real estate transaction that could look like this. Let me give you an example. I could be in front of the property and say, Perfect. so this property, you know, hadn't been on the market for 47 years. The couple that lived inside of it, they were 79 years old. It's a two-story property. They needed to get out of it. They don't have kids. They didn't know what to do with it. It probably needed, you know, $40,000 in, you know, fixability. I came in with two offers, an offer to take it clean exactly as it is, or an offer to do this. I ended up buying it clean and then I flipped it to one of my investors and I made a margin, but we ended up doing, you know, what, you know, whatever it is. Yeah. I've been talking about that forever. And then you put it on your Facebook page. And then what happens is the people that are actually interested in real estate and you and I both know there's, there's the research phase. Yeah. I'm interested in real estate investing yeah. and there's the transactional phase. That's a good deal. I'll take it. Yep. You with me? Oh yeah. For sure. What happens is agents will start to discover even in their own sphere that they've got some transactional people that are doing deals just not with them. Or maybe they're doing it in commercial or they're doing it in, you know, they want mixed use or they wanted, you know, multi-unit and this person was doing SFRs, but they raised their hand, right? The other, you know, the other thing is I tell people all the time, and it's funny because I'm thinking about one of my clients, Brian, in, in New York City, and you are such a perfect example of this, right? Um, the story in New York City is, the real estate's too expensive here. I can't find any deals. So nothing, you know, nothing adds up. Right. Yeah. So I'm like, well, Brian, why don't you, instead of repeatedly telling me that everything is too expensive, you know, with if, if New York city, right. If you know, like there's yep. no multiple listing service, it's a bunch of sites together and there's, you know, there's portals that kind of pull it all together, but it's not as sophisticated or as easy as like the MLS in the yep. rest of the world. U S so he starts this thing and I say, look, let's come up with a, a newsletter, email newsletter to your entire database and everybody else you know, brokers, et cetera, called Deal of the Month. Ah. So, so the story was myself and my team would sit around for about seven hours and we would look at properties that just came off the market. We'd look at properties that just came on the market. So off market, on market, mm -hmm. new. Yeah. Then we look at stuff that's at the five and six month mark about to expire on their listing contract. Yeah. Then we would look at our, what we call most likely data, which was again, those, you know, you look two story house, 79 year old couple, no mortgage. Yep. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. you know, most likely to move whatever that may be. And it's going to be different market to market. And we would work, you know, like he'd tell the story, like we would just pound through all of that stuff and we would identify just one property. In almost every case, it's not our listing. Yeah. But because we want to serve our investor community, we're going to find the one and we're going to push it out. Yep. If you'd like to be on our VIP list and get early access to it before the, the all hands newsletter, let us know. Exactly. And all of a sudden, first of all, Brian starts buying deals. Congratulations. Even if he's in Manhattan, he buys it in Long Island or, you know, on the other side of, you know, in Fort Lee, New Jersey, which is just over the GW, like who cares, right? right? The bottom line is he now is concentrating on finding deals and that network of true investors exploded. No, and exactly right. And I know you're a big fan of video and, and agents need to, again, stop being perfect and just get out there. I think the deal of the month idea yeah. is gold. Uh, I yeah. think, I think you know, real estate agents need to understand that investors are really kind of simple creatures, right? Yep. At least the transaction ones, not the research phase, right? The transaction ones, yep. right? We want a deal and we're typically either going to buy to hold, which was my model, right? I want something yep. that's going to cash flow with 20% down in a nice neighborhood where I can yep. go theoretically pick up rent myself without a gun. Yep. Uh, and then there's some people that go, Hey, I want the old house that hasn't been updated for 40 years. Cause I want to put in granite and, you know, you know, just change it up and, and sell. Yeah. yeah. But that's like maximizing yield versus just sort of easy, yeah. right? I mean, there's, there's no wrong way, but I know, you know, going back to, by the way, everyone that's watching, you know, <laughs> you know, shameless, shameless, shameless plug. <laughs> you haven't read this book, oh, right? That's, awesome. that's what's cool. But I think it's, you know, it always comes down to like knowing as an investor, yeah. like I mentioned you before, like my wife will basically buy any duplex in a certain part of Costa Mesa under a certain number of blocks and she knows everyone that is currently owned by, you know, like an investor. Cause you know, like what is it? There's like 11.2 million plexes in yep. the U S duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes, yep. right? Like, like we're kind of into that. We know that number. And then you know that like 
I want to say like ninety percent of them are mom and pop owners, yep. right? There's no there's no uh, hedge funds that are going after this stuff. It's really for all of us that want to create generational wealth for us, Absolutely. our family, and our friends. Yep. Um, so she knows that she's got her buy box, and anything that comes along that buy box, she goes. Uh, 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 rent, uh, can I increase? Da, 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 yep. Done. And now yep. in California, with our beautiful, crazy governor, yeah. you can turn every one of your duplexes into a triplex by eliminating the garage and converting that into another bedroom. ADU, exactly. Yep. Right? So it's just, you know, you know, you know, I'm preaching to the choir here. No, but th this is all great because people need to realize, uh, you know, a couple of things. So the, 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 the rub I get when I go to talk to, like I get invited to speak to real estate groups, right? Real estate agents, right? Yeah. How do we do this, right? You, you, you know, you, I've only ever bought out of the MLS until the last year, right? So yeah. I didn't have some system, no direct mail, none of that stuff. Yeah. You know, they, they ask, well, tell us how you work with your agents and you know, all of those ins and outs. And I'm like, the agents that bothered to ask me what I look for and gave me 10 minutes of their day, I did deals with. If you just yeah. take my email and send me your latest listing, I'm not going to look. No, right? don't put me in a drip deal. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's not about you. Remember? Yes, I know you have this great listing on 123 Main Street. Yeah, but don't, I don't, don't me that. I don't, I don't want that. So uh, that's, that's yeah. pretty awesome. The other yeah. thing is that is if you're paying attention in this game, cash buyers don't hide, right? You can go to your title company and say, hey, who are all the cash buyers in the last 30 days or 45 days? Yeah. You know, they, they, they're probably frequent buyers. Yes, there's the one-off that only do one, but you know, it's a pretty good bet that they're an investor and they're going to do multiple deals. So, yeah. So you know. everyone that's, that's watching, um, consider, and I, Michael, I just heard this number from a buddy of mine, uh, named Steve Harney, who does a, he does for the real estate agents, uh, a program called keeping current matters, okay. right? So he takes 5,000 real estate data points and then basically synthesizes it, codifies it, and then pushes it out to agents so they could be the empowered, you know, educator in their marketplace. For the people that are watching this, they should be looking at people like Ivy Zellman, mm -hmm. right? The Zellman report. So where Steve's is more sort of national news, Ivy covers every, every sector of the real estate, you know, commercial mortgage, you know, builders, what's going on, publicly traded companies and not phenomenal research. They both basically say the same thing. It's like 36% of all homes in the U S have no mortgage. Wow. That's interesting to me. Now, if I was a local investor, I'd probably go to my agent and say, do you have, whether it's Corfax, which is a, a, a data mining solution or remind, which I'm an investor in. So I prefer to use that one. <laughs> remind, you could go in and basically say, show me, Every property, like it's just, it just overlays the MLS, Michael, show me every property in the MLS where there's no mortgage, right? Where it's a, it was acquired in 2006, seven, eight, maybe not six, seven, eight, nine, yep. right? Or even some of my friends, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 sure. in your marketplace. And then you look at the run that happening. 50% of all homes in the U S right now have more than 50% equity. Oh yeah, for sure. Like that's bananas. But as an investor, when you start digging into the data and you know what your buy box is, it becomes super easy. Hey, agent, go knock on that door, that door, that door, that door. Here, here's my written offer. Yep, exactly. Right? You, can, you can get really detailed today and very specific and cut out a lot of the nonsense. Yeah. So again, this is what Tom is giving you here, guys, is gold because he's saying that agents and investors, if you just sit down, respect each other, have a conversation about what you're looking for, yeah. you can help each other uh, and you'll be an asset. And you know, it's a mutually beneficial deal. And listen, I tell my agents, so sorry, investors, I tell my agents, when you find a smoking hot deal, you are an idiot if all you do is hit enter into the MLS. Call me. Yeah. Right. Like, and that's what the investor should be saying. Right. Like, yeah, don't, don't hit enter in the MLS when you find the person that is, I'm sorry, we call it the three D's, right. Death, divorce, and default. Yep. Right. Don't do that. Right. Call me and, or I'm going to call you as an active investor and I'm not going to have one agent. I'm going to have seven oh, or eight. Yeah, for sure. And I'm going to be working them all the time saying, what do you see? What do you see? What do you see? Like, that's what an active smart investor, and 
you could do that having an FTE, right? Being a full-time employee. Absolutely. Yeah. One email or a text or a video every week. No, I, I couldn't agree more. One of my goals when I started all this back in 2003, because again, I invest in a market I've never spent the night in and I had never been till until I was 31. Uh, in wow. Fresno, California, right? Yeah. So I've still never spent the night. In, I've been there almost 20 years. Yeah. Um, was to meet two agents a week. And I did that while having a full-time job where I could be on a different continent, right? Yeah, it, just, it doesn't matter. That's the beauty of today's world. Like, you know, I can imagine like my stepmom buying real estate back in the day and, you know, living in Los Angeles and having to drive <laughs> to San Diego yeah. to go look at a 20-unit building and, you know, you don't know the property manager. Yeah. <laughs> you, you don't, know, I mean, it's just, there's so, like, Today, yep. everything yep. you want is here. No, it's super it's, easy. It's, it's, yeah, your excuse, the, the excuses that I will tolerate are very, very little, right? Yeah. Your access is out there. You can do it while sitting on the couch at the airport terminal. I mean, I've done it, right? Yeah. I, yeah. I, I looked at my market every day for 10 years. And again, I had no access. I used realtor.com or like site. And, yeah. you know, yeah. I bought one rental at a time. It, it works. I got to tell you, this part of your book, right? The, the cool. 21 things they need to know, like that, that to me, oh, thank you. Old. I know you sell this book, but is this on your blog for free as a download? Cause it uh, should be. Okay. I will make that happen. I have not. Yeah. That. And, and you know, so, sorry, coach, every one of those should be a four to five minute video that you shoot as well. Ah, see. Yeah. I just took an action item from Tom Ferry. I like it. Sorry. It's a you know, ABC baby. Always be coaching. There you go. I appreciate it. I, I got that for free. I like it. <laughs> I, I will be doing that. Uh, I will get some of those up before the end of the year. Just, just because yeah. it was great advice. I should do Good that. Good man. Awesome. Um, Spread the word, man. The more people that know, the more people that know, the more people that know, the more wealth that gets created, the, the less bad deals happen. Exactly. And again, the reason I reached out to you in the very beginning is because I see where you're at and just helping people. That's what you're authentic in helping people. And yes, your success by other measures, if you want to say that, but I don't get that vibe from you, right? It's about, Hey, I'm impacting people's lives and uh, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to chase behind you and, and, and help as many people as I can. So that's pretty cool. hundred percent, man. Awesome. 100%. Well, one thing I knew I wanted to talk about is your success summit. I think it's in August. Yeah. Um, why don't we talk about it? It's a three day event. Uh, if you want, we can talk about the last one, kind of what it was, and then what you're planning for the next one, if you want to tease anything there. Yeah. I mean, so I think anybody that works for a major corporation, there's probably some annual, you know, conference that, you know, the company has, or that you guys, like we send a lot of people to conferences inside my company to go yep. learn specific knowledge. In, in the residential real estate space, it's very typical, you know, major corporations do their annual convention. People like myself do an annual convention. So the summit's that for us. It's actually four days long oh, four days, and, and we'll bring in, you know, call it 6,000 real estate agents, uh, owners of companies, um, some, some ancillary, you know, mortgage, title, escrow, people that are working in the real estate transaction, a lot of real estate technology companies um, coming there, you know, whether as a, spa, a sponsor or just to, to be on the pulse of what the very best agents are doing. Right. And over the four days, basically it's, Hey, like here's the most important trends that are happening as a residential real estate agent to be ahead of the curve, right? Yep. Whether that was ready in 2007 when I was talking about, hey, you might want to look at this Facebook thing or 2009, it might be time to get on YouTube and start shooting videos or truthfully ready in 2005 when I said do all my, my 800 people back then, <laughs> it was my second year in the business or in this new company saying, Hey guys, every sign is here. We're about to go into a massive real estate collapse. So now was the time to start calling all your bankers. Now is the time to understand REOs. Mm -hmm. And, and like, could you imagine in 2005 saying that 2005, 2006, oh, I'm people, doing this. Yeah. And people were like, fairy, you're negative. Yeah, exactly. We don't like you. I just leased my, my third Rolls Royce. Uh, I am the shizzle and I'm like thinking to myself, you're dead. Yeah. You're dead. Right? You're dead man walking. <laughs> yeah. I got started in 1989 when the whole, when, when the mantra was just survive until 1995. I remember. Yeah. Right. Like that was the, and we didn't even know what would happen. We just, we were praying, right. <laughs> that the world would speed up and things would get back to some level of normalcy, you know, like 11 and a half percent interest rates, like yeah. normal. Right? Yeah. Normal. Of course. 
So at this event, we do trends, and then we do a lot of case studies of best marketing tactics, best new approaches. We definitely do some mindset work because so many of us, myself included, that our head is a scary place to be. So oh, we spend sure. some time doing some very tactical things to get people outside of themselves, that, you know, whether it's to be more confident, to be a better you know, influencer, just every, you know, negotiation ex, you know, expertise, sales and marketing expertise, running your business like a business, being a lot more organized, all that stuff is covered and more. And what's unique about it is I've got so many amazing clients. Now we'll do you know, 60 different breakout sessions being led by the, the number one agent at Intero in Silicon Valley, who is a personal client of mine named Andy C, who dominates two marketing strategies in real estate, open houses and geographic farm. Now those are, Michael, those are as, as old as dirt, right? Right, yeah. And yet, because iterative, not you know trying to blaze the new saddle and try something that no one else has ever done before, like let's just make it better, that young guy as a real estate agent will do anywhere between, you know, here we are at the end of the year, so I get the final numbers this week, Call it ten and a half to eleven million dollars in commission income wow. in real estate. So to have him stand up and say to people, "These are the five things I do to drive traffic in. These are the three most important questions that I ask when I engage with a customer. This is how I manage having lots of Silicon Valley. Come on, right? Saratoga, yeah, a, a three bedroom, two bath home, seven blocks from you know." new Apple headquarters or, you know, whatever, something like that, like 9,000 buyers come in and the bidding war begins. Yeah. Well, well, how do you sort through to find who's real, who's not, you know what I mean? And yeah. then so having people share that kind of wisdom yeah. with brand new agents and people 45 years in the business so they don't have to reinvent the wheel. Like that's what that conference is all about for me. Well, that's awesome. Uh, one thing I know I want to ask, you know, just given that we're both in the game uh, for a long time now is, is, you know, as we exit 2019, right. Mm -hmm. I think it's fair to say we're closer to the peak than the bottom. I think that, yeah, yeah you can't argue that. Yeah. Um, you know, I and, think the, and yeah, but mm -hmm. Michael, but every sign says this 11 year bull market could go out to 2021, 2020. Oh, for sure. For sure. Absolutely. Right? And, and remember, I was the one that was beating the drum, like, holy smokes, 2005, it's over, 2006, it's over. And then I was like, oh, darn, I was right. <laughs> yeah, ouch, that hurt. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, so that, it, it's interesting to see where we're at now because uh, it's very different, right? I still remember 2005, six, seven, I was active, right? So I, I, I yeah. saw it coming. We actually 1031 out of houses into apartments. So we escaped well, Good right? We, we were fine. My mom did the same exact thing, but all into triple net lease shopping centers. Ah, there you go. Well, that even better. Yeah. Already at the end of 2005. <laughs> Smart. I, I'm yeah. just going to follow what she does. I'm just going to. Uh, that's, hey, that's what I do. Hey, what are you <laughs> buying? Right? Yeah. So, what are you doing today? Let me take you to dinner. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the good news is she lives, like we're in terrace living. I live here. She lives here. So there I'm like, go. hey, what are you <laughs> buying now? That is awesome. So th let's talk about it. What do you, I mean, what do you see going on in 2020 as far as uh, demand, supply? Obviously, interest rate, I think, stay low, right? Because we're both used to it. You know, we've both seen a lot higher. Um, yeah. Just, just well, another Fed, solid year. Yeah, the Fed just came out and said no interest rate yep. change, you know, forecasted for 2020, which is a blessing. Yep. Um, if, again, if you read Ivy Zellman, if you, you know, there's, there's just so many data points that you can pull from. What we basically have in the, in the residential market is basically four markets, right? So you got first time buyer market, yep. you got first time seller market, you got beginning of high end, and you have ultra lux, yep. right? There is, I don't know, a one day supply of homes on the market, right, yep. for this area, yep. which is interesting because you start looking at what's happening. You've got this overwhelming buyer demand coming in with interest rates of being low. The builders have been behind for, I mean, years, yeah, forever. Yeah. yeah, I mean, since 2007, right when the wheels came off. Yep. And they're yet they're yet to build enough product, right? So so we're in trouble there. You got two and a half million properties that are owned by all these hedge funds. Yeah. Right. Reads, and if you look at the like the disparity, you know what we need? We need them to put every home on the market, and then we'd be okay. Yeah. True. Right. But the challenge is, remember when they were all buying? You know, and it, 
Blackstone, I mean, everybody, right? I mean, anybody in their right mind that had money said, hey, buy low, sell high, right? But what's happened is the rate of return for them because of appreciation and the rents, it's crazy. right? They all said, screw it, we're not gonna sell any of this stuff. Yeah, why would we? Or why would they? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right? I mean, if anything, take it public and cash in on it. I mean, it's, it's bananas. So look, we, we don't see enough building. The you know first time first time home buyer first time home seller that market is is as hard as it can be Agreed. to get into and that's challenging and, you know in your area oh, yeah. that's a million two that's right easy. for a for a two bedroom no bath meter right yeah and you know, I live in Newport Beach Corona Del Mar it's it's the same thing right so what's happening is the first time buyers are being pushed an hour away from where they work ninety minutes away from where they work yeah right. Yep. So, you know, I mean, like there's nothing new in that. You can go back to 25 years ago when we said, follow wherever the next Walmart goes and buy everything you can because in 10 years, it'll, you know what I mean? Like yeah. nothing new in that. So that's going to be a disparity, a disparity issue for the first time buyer, huge opportunity for, for the first time seller. What we need is to reverse the dominoes. We need the, the beginning of the luxury market where there's too much inventory. Agreed. And the only stuff that's selling is turnkey beautiful. Yep. You with me? And by the way, old is anything three years old. Yeah. Like that's the reality, right? I just, mm -hmm. I just bought a, a condo in Dallas and they're like, oh, this thing is like brand new. It was built in 2014. I'm like, oh, let me guess. There's carpet. Yeah, exactly. I'm like, you don't buy a house with carpet today. You know what I mean? <laughs> what? Right? So anything that's three years old is old, right? Four years, five years, six years is dated, right? Looks yep. shabby. And yet the seller's like, this is my house. I want a premium price, blah, blah, blah. So if we can get them to reduce their price, the first time seller will move up. Yep. And then these guys and gals, depending upon their age and where they're at, maybe they'll step up to that X million, X multi-million, 10 million, whatever, you know, whatever, 2 million, 5 million, 10 million, yep. or they'll go back down and go buy that condo and move from the Northeast to Southern New York, yep. AKA Florida. Yep. Right. Which we see that massive migration oh, yeah. happening. Yep. Or you look at, you look at any one of the Southern states, right? Especially the ones with zero income tax. Yep. Where the coast is finally figured out, Hey, Denver. Yeah. It snows, but there's 4% state income tax with a pretty decent housing market. Yeah. You know I mean, yeah. not Dallas, but surrounding, same thing, not Phoenix, but surrounding. Yep. I think, I think 2020 is going to be bananas. Yeah. And between you and I, I'll probably buy five or six more duplex. Yeah. Easy. Maybe yeah. 10 if I can pull it off. Yeah, I think I'm on record. Actually, I just did a video this morning, the daily financial update that 2020 is going to be fine for real estate. The ultra high end is going to get a little sticky. Oh, um, no doubt. Yeah, no, no. that that market's a little little iffy right now. But anywhere else, I think you're right, and I do think it's that that market two and market three collapsing a little bit yeah. is what kind of unlocks all of this. Yeah. Um, now here's a little fun fact. So one of my clients, Gary Gold in Beverly Hills, in the last three years has sold two properties north of a hundred million dollars. One was the Playboy Mansion. Wow. Listed for two hundred million, sold it for a hundred, basically to the next door neighbor. Oh yeah, I heard. I read that story. Yeah. Yep. Right, great, great guy, long time client. Then, after he closed that deal, got a come list me call for a three hundred and fifty million dollar house uh, that Lenchlin, um, oh, I'm gonna space the the Aussie family that owns everything. Rupert Murdoch, right? Murdoch, so yeah. Murdoch, uh, three hundred fifty million dollar list price closed for undisclosed. We think one hundred and fifty million. There you go. Yeah. So it's it's funny. The problem is when that happens. You know, what everybody says in the high end. Raise my price. Oh. Well, think about it. Yeah, it, of course. It was yeah. for 350 and it sold for 150 which was probably true market value. Yeah. And I'm on the market for 10 I mean, if I told you right now the number of properties that are available on the west side of LA, you know, that are in the 25 to 45 million range, most people would throw up in their mouth. There's so much inventory for the one buyer that's going to buy a house in the next 18 months. Exactly. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So I see it there. So I know you have to go. You have a meeting you got to get to. I want you to close with how can people follow Tom Ferry? Where do you want him to go? IG, Facebook, where do you want him to go? Whatever, whatever your flavor is. Uh, you know, I'm super active on Twitter. I'm super active on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube. 
Um, probably the thing that uh, I'm, I'm most proud of, and thank you for that, Michael. I, I appreciate that endorsement. Um, in the last, I don't know, what was it, a year? I'm looking at Courtney on my team. Uh, I started this thing where I'd say on Instagram stories, got a question? And I don't know how many thousands and thousands of questions I've answered now, whether they were direct messages or, you know, where I was able to post it to have everybody else learn from it. That has been remarkable. And, and look, I get 17 year olds that say, Hey, my parents want me to, to go to college and I don't really care. I want to go into sales. What do you think? Yep. They also get, Hey, I'm sleeping with my assistant and <laughs> I, you know, having an affair and I'm sure just like, <laughs> Ah! Like probably not going to post that on the public page, but I send <laughs> yeah. a private message to you know real estate investors, real estate agents, you know tech companies. I don't have all the answers, um, and I'm I'm very honest when I say, hey man, outside of my pay grade or not my expertise, you sh you should contact Michael and talk about that. Yeah. But it but it is a very cool way at sorry you know Courtney eleven thirty to one o'clock in the morning to be up and to be helping. Yeah. So I'd probably say Instagram would be a good place to start. Yeah. And so a couple of things didn't close before I hit stop record. First and foremost, Tom, I want to thank your team, Kelsey, Ruby, and Brenda were amazing in getting this put together. So I want to thank those ladies for doing this for us. Uh, it was awesome. And again, folks, um, I don't care if you're in real estate or not, you need to follow Tom Ferry. Again, I look at his stuff and I just feel better. Uh, and there's very few people out there that are this genuine that are truly trying to help and you feel better when you sort of close your app than not. So Tom, I want to thank you very much for doing all that you do. I appreciate that, Michael. It's very kind. So I wish you and your fam and all of, uh, all of your tribe an absolutely extraordinary 2020, a safe and great holidays or new year, the whole nine yards. 2020 is going to be bananas. So pay attention. If you're an investor and you're playing on the sides, right, doing a little too much research, not enough transactions, either find something that you're absolutely interested in or get a little transactional because I'll, I'll leave you with this story. One of my mentors was on the ninth floor of a company called the Irvine Company. And if you know the name Donald Bren, uh, Bren is, I don't know, 15th, 16th, wealthiest man in the world, all through real estate acquisition, bought the Irvine Company back in like 1982 for like 385 million. And ready? He bought one Santa Monica place, which is right on the 405 freeway in LA, and admitted to overpaying by 50 million. And at 70 years old when he bought it, said, hey, in 20 years, it'll be a deal. <laughs> there you go. There's some long-term thinking. Thank you again, Tom. This has been absolutely amazing in my favorite interview ever. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. All the best, guys.